This is the fifth and final video in our relations module in our discrete math review for foundations of computer science. All right, so before we move on from relations in general, I want to mention a few operations and ways of combining relations that are good to be aware of. So remember that relations are sets. And so what that means is uh, that we can combine them using the same operations we use on uh, sets. Uh, in particular, if we have arbitrary relations R1 and R2, we can form their union, uh, we can form their intersection, we can subtract R2 from R1, and we can subtract R1 from R2. When we do operations like this, we usually expect that uh, our, our relations R1 and R2 have the same arity. That is, you know, they're both binary relations, or they're both ternary relations, or they're both anary relations where the n is the same number. And uh, that's not an absolute requirement. They're, they're just sets and you can combine them uh, if you want. But um, if you if they do not have the same arity, then I, the result is going to be kind of weird, right? Like if you try to intersect two relations that are of different arity, you're probably going to get nothing in the intersection, you know, etc. Um, so this is just a general note about what, uh, from context, people usually are assuming uh, when we're working with this kind of operation. So another very powerful way of combining relations together is called composition, or uh, we can sometimes say you're composing two relations. And we write this with a, a little circle for the notation. Uh, there's alternate notations out there. This is the one we're going to use. And we say that R1 is composed with uh, R2 in this example, where R1 and R2 are relations. Now, inherently, I think this is a pretty intuitive idea. You take one relation and another relation, and you sort of combine them together and get this uh, composite relation. Um, but when we go to write the formal uh, expression of this, it can be easy to get bogged down. So I'm going to try to provide an example um, that will sort of preserve the intuition throughout. So I've come up with this idea that we're going to have R2 is going to be a relation between people and horses, right? Where R, uh, we have some uh, X and Y, some pair, it's a binary relation, then they are related, we'll say, if X is a person that owns Y and Y is a horse. And the reason I picked that is uh, this is not going to be a homogeneous relation here. So clearly the set of people that X is drawn from is not the same set as the set of horses that Y is drawn from. So I can call this S1 and S2. And you know here are all my people in my set that I'm thinking of. And then over here, you know, maybe in another color I have a bunch of horses and I say that things are related uh, if you know I can put an edge between them this is a little different from my last diagram but uh, you get the idea right that person has two horses this person has only one horse this person here has three horses and then we have uh, maybe two people with no horses at all so that would be an example of a relation so that's certainly nothing you haven't seen before. And we can, just to keep things straight, just kind of label that this was our set of people and this here is horses. And then move this whole thing out of the way for right now. And just so we remember that was R2, put that up here. And now we want to define another relation, which is going to be R1, and this is another kind of silly example, but hopefully it'll be useful. And it's going to be a relation where X and Y are related as a pair if uh, X is a horse and Y is some bag of oats that belongs to the horse, right? In this world, horses can accumulate their own wealth in oats. So here we have another set. So I'm going to uh, sort of confusingly write S4 for right now. We'll see why I'm doing that later. So this is my set of bags of oats, and uh, I'm gonna change this so, there we go. The relation really should indicate movement uh, between these two sets, that's why I'm putting it in the middle. And 
So we have these horses and we'll say that uh, this horse here perhaps owns two bags of oats and it's related there. And this one owes one bag of oats and this one down here has three bags of oats. And there's a bunch of bags of oats that nobody owns. And then we could also say, you know, maybe there's some horses here that were wild horses. People did not own them. They're out here, not in this original group, uh, but they are still horses and, and maybe they have some bags of oats that they've somehow accumulated. And then we'll just leave ourselves a note here that reminds us that S4 contains oats. And so all of this uh, kind of elaborate example is simply to say that when we compose these two relations, we form this new relation that intuitively is now relating people and oats. It sort of bridges these uh, three sets together, right? And the reason that uh, S2, I skip from S2 to S4, is that I'm really thinking of this set in the middle as the intersection of two sets, right? Because it's possible that my set of horses that I'm relating to oats and my set of horses that people were related to were not exactly the same, but we needed to find the intersection here. And that's why these extra uh, horses on the outside here, we're looking at something, something like this. Right, this intersection of two things. I'll write this out uh, in, in notation in a minute so you can see maybe a little bit more clearly what's happening in the middle here. However, uh, the thing that should be pretty straightforward is that R2 is a pair of uh, people to horses and R1 contains pairs of horses to oats. And so our composition is going to contain pairs of people to oats, where here the, the re relation is those are the oats owned by the horses owned by the people, right? That is our, uh, our just our intuitive level at which we're trying to understand what's happening when we compose these things. So please keep that in mind as we work through uh, how you express it in formal terms. The last thing before we do move on to that is notice the order in which this is written in and just pay a little attention to that for a minute. Remember we have S1 cross S2. Those are the pairs in R2 and we said uh, S3 cross S4 are the pairs in R1. So we, uh, we, we're ordering our sets in a, from sort of from right to left. Uh, rather than left to right. And uh, this varies actually depending on whose textbook you're reading. But what we're trying to do here is keep consistent with a uh, function composition in which uh, we have some something that looks like this, right? We want to keep these things in the same order. And if this were a function, we would think, you know, what's going in to our inner function is going to be people. And then it's going to give us the output would be something like horses that would come out. And that's what goes back into the outer function. And then the outer function gives us, say this whole thing here, gives us oats, right? So if it helps you to think of R1 of R2 like this, that uh, is fine. You don't usually pass arguments into relations, but this might help you remember that you're kind of going uh, this way from passing in here, right? So we're getting our people are going in, and then everything those people are related to is a big set that's coming out, and that'll be their set of horses. And then that's going into R1 and getting us uh, oats. That's the order. It is a little difficult to keep straight, so you have to practice to get used to it. All right, great. So now that we've laid that all out, my hope is that the definition will be very easy to follow and everything will go very smoothly. So the way we define this formally is we assume R2 is a relation on R S1 cross S2. So remember, it's pairs of the form S1 comma S2 formed from that Cartesian product, and R1 is a relation on S3, S4, right? So it says S3 comma S4, those are the pairs in R1. 
And they're abstract sets, but remember you can think of people in oats and horses if you want. Remember that S2 and S3 are both sets of horses. They just may be different uh, horses. Okay, so uh, we then, we, we sort of resolve that by finding the intersection of, uh, we find the intersection of S2 and S3, and that kind of becomes our middle set that's gonna join these two relations together. And we'll have another picture of this in a minute. Um, when we do the composition, we get this new set, S1 cross S4. And remember, we were thinking of S1 as our set of people and S4 as our set of oats. And this was people's horses is oats. So that's what we expect. So, so far, so good. And then the way we define this relation is just like other relations. It's a set of tuples. We say it's the tuples X, y, X, Z, uh, that are in the composition of R1 and R2, if and only if there exists some Y in S, such that Y, Z is in R1 and X, Y is in R2. So remember, S is the intersection of our two sets, S2 and S3. It's the set that bridges the gap between these two things. And so this really depends on this existence of this Y. So what is Y? Well, it's a horse, right? Y is a horse that uh, some person owns and that happens to own some oats, right? If there isn't such a horse, then we can't relate uh, people, our X, to our oats. Right, so we, we have to have this sort of bridge element here, and that element isn't in the pair, but the, the relation that the pair describes depends on the existence of this element. So now the next little note should be pretty easy, right? If uh, S is the empty set, meaning if there is no horse that uh, is both owned by a person and owns oats, then this composition is also empty. Nothing is related. Now, I did promise I would show you another diagram of what's going on here, and so here it is. This is an abstract version of what we drew out before with our uh, horse person owed example. Um, and here you can just see uh, S1 is our beginning set, and I put A, B, and C in it. Um, S is the intersection, remember, of S2 and S3, and we'll write intersection. And that just has a, another number of abstract elements, W, X, Y, and Z. And S1 is not related to everything in there. It is related to a few things, right? So only a few things uh, make it all the way through. They have to be related from S1 to S, uh, and, and in this case, that X dead ends, right? And then they have to kind of get all the way over to S4, right? And then they make it into the final relation. So if I were to write this final relation, I'm really focusing on these elements. These are what I wrote up here as the Y. This is the sort of bridge element. It has to exist for the final pair to be in there. So since this bridge element W is there, for example, then we, we know that C and R is going to be a pair. And so we've written out these oops, written out these pairs here, right there, C and R. Uh, you can also see B and T is a pair because B goes to Z and Z goes to T and so on. And so hopefully you could uh, look at this and figure out why these other two pairs are in there and understand uh, what's happening with this composition of relations. So now the last operation we'll define on relations is powers of binary relations. And once you've absorbed the definition of composition, this is actually relatively easy uh, in my opinion. So we have uh, R, uh, some binary homogeneous relation on S. In this case, all the sets are going to be the same. And then we can recursively define the powers of this relation R to the N, or inductively define them, uh, by R1 is just R itself. This is just the original relation. And then uh, each subsequent step, Rn plus one, is equal to Rn composed with R. Now, as I said, uh, we're just using the composition definition from the previous slide here uh, and, and applying it um, repeatedly to itself. 
but you will have to change the example you use a little bit because again it's homogeneous right so uh, separating things out into um, sets of non-overlapping objects like people horses and oats isn't going to work it could be better to think of this as like friends right so your first level is your friends and then the second level when you apply it to yourself is the friends of your friends and then you can go to friends of friends of friends etc and it's easy to imagine building a, a social network this way and in fact uh, networking in the abstract, modeling networks, is an application of this. It's useful for defining paths of length n, where uh, n is the number of hops away from the beginning. So remember, if you're if you're talking about a friend, maybe that's one hop. That's r1. A friend of a friend is two hops. So you can think of this in terms of paths moving through a network. We'll see this again, actually, in modal logic in a slightly different application. Uh, which we'll come back to towards the end of the course. Okay, so that concludes our section on uh, relations proper, and we will now move on to a uh, special kind of relation um, called a function, and that is coming up in the next video.